Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. The author al-Hajjawi, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said in his book, Zad al-Mustaqna, fi ikhtisar al-Nuqna, he said, wa minha satr al-Awra. And from the conditions of the prayer is the satr of the Awra, is the concealing of the Awra. In Lisan al-Arab, as mentioned by Sheikh Khalid al-Mushayqih, he said that the Awra al-Lughatan is al-Nuqsan wa shay al-Mustaqbih. Al-Nuqsan wal shay al-Mustaqbih. Nuqsan meaning something which is devalued, okay, or loss. And shay al-Mustaqbih, something which is not good to look upon, okay. Something which is not good to look upon. This is the awrah. And the Imam, the author now, he's going to define for us what is the awrah technically. What does it literally mean? So firstly, he says, for yajibu, it's obligatory. He's going to talk about it's obligatory for a person to cover their awrah. What is the word wajib technically? What does it mean? If you do it, ma yuthabu fa'ilihi wa yu'aqib tarikihi. That the one who does the action is going to be rewarded and the one who leaves the action is going to be punished, possibly, if Allah wishes to do so. Okay, this is the definition. So Allah in Surah Al-A'raf, He says, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zina dakum in the kulli masjid. O oh, children of Adam, take your zina when you go to every masjid. Adorn yourselves, meaning cover your aura in the best way possible when you go to the masjid to pray. And also the Prophet Sallallahu said, as collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, uh, the Prophet said, لا يقبل الله صلاة حائد إلا بخمار That Allah Azawajal will not accept the prayer of the mature woman, the one who can experience menstruation, unless she has a khimar. And khimar here means the full covering. Okay, the covering from head to toe. Okay. What's going to be spoken about? So this hadith is telling us that it's obligatory. That if Allah is not going to accept the salah, unless she's covered. Meaning that it's obligatory to cover the awrah. Okay. So, what the author is going to speak about here in this chapter is what is known as Al-Awra fi Babi Salah. The Awra which is in the Salah. Because the Awra in the Salah is different to the Awra fi Babi Nadr. The Awra which is looked upon outside of the Salah. There's some slight differences, okay? So what he's concentrating on here is that which is looked upon or that which is necessity in the Salah. So he says the Awra should be, it's obligatory upon you, bima la yasifu basharatahu. It's obligatory to cover yourself with that which doesn't describe your body. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, Sinfani min ahli nal lam arahuma. He said, two types of people, I've never seen them before, the Prophet ﷺ said, and they are from the people of the hellfire. He said, one of them, Nisa'un kasiyat, ariyat, mumayyilat, ma'ilat. The Prophet ﷺ described women who are clothed yet naked. They walk with an enticing type of walk, trying to get people to look at them with something on their heads that looks like the humps of camels leaning to one side. This is how the Prophet ﷺ described them. But the point from them being in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is saying that they were clothed yet naked. And he mentioned the word, kasiyat ariyat. Imam Nawi rahimullah ta'ala, he said ariyat means that their clothing is so thin that you can clearly see the aura. Okay, the clothing is so thin that it doesn't cover the aura. Imam Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi rahimullah ta'ala, he said in al-Mughni, the famous encyclopedia of fiqh that he wrote, he gave a dhabit. And we said this word dhabit when we use it in fiqh, we're meaning that it's the qualifying rule. It's a qualifying rule, okay? So he's giving us what is a qualifying rule of what is the awra acceptable. He said, فَإِن كَانَ خَفِيفًا يُبَيْنُ لَوْنُ الْجِلْدِ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ فَيُعْلَمُ بَيَاضُهُ أَوْ هُمْرَتُهُ لَمْ تَجُوزَ صَلَافِهِ لِأَنَّ سَتْرَ لَا يَحْصُلُ بِذَلِكِ He said, if the clothing which is worn and you are able to see the color of the skin, the whiteness of the skin, or the darkness of the skin from uh, beyond the clothing, then this is clothing which doesn't cover the sutra. It doesn't cover the awrah, okay? It has to be clothing to the extent it's thick enough that you cannot see the skin of a person. If you can see the skin of a person, the color behind their clothing, then this means they are not covering their awrah. And also many of the ulama, they said that it shouldn't be dayiq. It shouldn't be tight to the extent where the person's shape clearly of his body parts can be seen. And sadly, today many men, let alone the women, wear very tight clothing when they pray. So when they're going to sujood, you're shocked by what you see. It's as though the person is not wearing something. So we have to bear this in mind that when we go into the sujood, do we really want everyone to be seeing our situation of our body, right? 
A lot of men, they fall into this mistake. They pray in too tight a clothing. You have to try to ensure that your clothing is as loose as possible. And if you cannot do so, then you wear an overgarment, which covers at least down to your knees. طيب, the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, وَعَوْرَةُ رَجُلٍ وَأَمَّةٍ وَأُمِّ وَلَدٍ وَمُعْتَقٍ بَعْضُهَا مِنَ الصُرَّةِ إِلَى رُكْبَةٍ the author he's going to speak about now what is known as awratun mutawassitatun the middle level awra awratun mutawassitatun the middle level uh, of covering so he says the awra of a man or the female slave and the um walad um walad is a female slave but she's given birth to her master's child um walad right she's given birth to her master's child and she will become free via his death if he doesn't free her before that وَمُعْتَقٍ بَعْضُهَا The مُعْتَقْ بَعْضُهَا is also a female slave, but she has been freed partly. Part of her has been freed. Maybe she purchased from her master part of her freedom, right? So these people, the man and all these others, right? Their awra is from the surra ila rukba, From the belly button until the knee. From the belly button until the knee, this is the awra, which is a must to be uh, covered in the salah. And this is known as awratun mutawasitatun. Okay? So somebody who is a male, 10 and above, and in these categories that we mentioned. Now here speaking about slavery, just a side point, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr, in one of his lectures, he mentioned that the world now has kind of united upon the abolition of slavery on paper. Though in reality it still takes place in many different forms. He said, as for the Muslims, they've agreed and signed up to many of these agreements. So it's something which is not abolished legislatively, but legally, you hardly find any slavery Islamically taking place. So this is an important point that he mentioned. And he said, in fact, Ibn Hajj al 500 years ago mentioned this point. It's not just him that is mentioning it. Okay? Anyhow, so they, we said that the awra of these people is from where? The belly button to the knee, right? But they have a rule in fiqh where they say أَنَّ الْحَدْ لَا يَدْخُلْ فِي الْمَحْدُودِ أَنَّ الْحَدْ لَا يَدْخُلْ فِي الْمَحْدُودِ That the, the boundary of a thing that you are speaking about doesn't enter into what you are speaking about. So the boundary here is the belly button, right? We're speaking about the awra between the belly button and the knees. So you have a boundary of the belly button, the head, and you have the head of the knees. So according to the rule that I mentioned أَنَّ الْحَدْ لَا يَدْخُلْ فِي الْمَحْدُودِ that these boundaries do not enter into what is being spoken about. So the belly button and the knees are not awra, according to the famous opinion of the Hanbali scholars, okay? The belly button and the knees are not awra of, of the man and those female slaves that were explained. And then he says, well, All of the woman, the free woman is awra except for her face in the salah, okay? This is known as awratun. Mughalladatun, the severe aura, or the more stressed aura. Auratun Mughalladatun. Tirmidhi, Imam Tirmidhi, may Allah have mercy upon him, collects from the Prophet Sallallahu who said, Al Mar'atu Kullaha Aura. That the woman, all of her is aura. All of her is to be covered in certain situations, right? The Mashhur opinion, the famous opinion in the Madhab of the Hanbali scholars is that the hands and the feet have to also be covered in the salah. The hands and the feet have to be covered in the salah. Though Ibn Taymiyyah, he says they don't have to. But the famous opinion in the, amongst the Hanbali scholars that the hands and the feet have to be covered in the salah. And Shaykh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr in his explanation, he said that many of the scholars, they say outside of the salah that the woman's face also has to be covered, right? The woman's face also has to be covered is a very strong opinion. The Imam, the author, he moves on and he says, وَيُسْتَحَبُّ صَلَاتُهُ فِي ثَوْبَيْنِ it's recommended for the man to pray in two pieces of clothing, okay? The izar and the rida, okay? The upper and bottom, two separate pieces of clothing, if one is able to do that. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, collected by Imam Ahmad and Nabi Dawood, إِذَا كَانَ لِأَحَدِكُمْ ثَوْبَانِ فَلْيُصَلِّ فِيهِمَا فَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ إِلَّا ثَوْبٌ وَاحِدٌ فَلْيَتَّزِ بِهِ وَلَا يَسْتَمِلْ إِشْتِمَالَ الْيَحُودِ the Prophet ﷺ said, if a person has two pieces of clothing, then let him pray in them. But if it's the case that he cannot find it except for one, then let him tie it around his waist, tightly, right? And he said, do not gather your clothing, istimal al-Yahud, in a way that the Yahud used to gather it. 
the author he says وَيَكْفِي سَتْرُ عَوْرَاتِهِ فِي النَّفَلِ However, in the Nafal prayer, it suffices you, if you wanted to, to only cover your aura, which is, what's the aura of the man? The belly button to the knee. Okay, so if the person is praying a Nafal prayer, and he wants to shock people, he can pray in his uh, aura only covering the belly button to the knee, right? This is in the Nafal prayer. Because Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, he did so. He did so, he prayed in the Nafal prayer. What makes his action significant is that Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu is the one who narrates the hadith pertaining to the next point. The next point is, the Imam, he says, And one of the atiqai must be covered in the obligatory prayer. Because the Prophet sallallahu said in Bukhari al-Muslim, لَا يُصَلِّ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الثَّوْبِ الْوَاحِدِ لَيْسَ لَا عَاتِقَيْهِ مِنْهُ شَيْءٍ That none of you should pray in one piece of clothing and there is nothing upon his atiq from it. The atiq is that which is between the neck and the shoulder. Okay, so around here somewhere. There should be something connected to the clothing. Okay, preferably on both sides. If not, at least on one side, connected to the clothing when you are praying in your obligatory prayer. Why do you think that is? Apart from the Prophet Sallallahu clearly telling us. Why do you think that may be? What's the ta'lil? Hmm? No, this is just clothing in the salah, whether ihram or not, because your clothing could fall down, right? So it's imperative or it's better to have something in the obligatory prayer, which keeps the clothing up by having it around your uh, atiq, okay? So this was the important thing that Abu Huraira, he's the one who narrated this hadith, which is pertaining to the obligatory salah, having something atiq connected to your clothing, right? However, when he prayed the Nafal Salah, he didn't do that. He had just something around his waist. So that shows you that in the Nafal Salah it's permissible. Because the Sahabi who narrated the hadith about it being obligatory did opposite to it. Which shows that in the Nafal it's allowed to do the opposite. I mean, without the thing around your atiq. But in the obligatory, like the author said, you have to have something connected to your neck from the clothing. Right? وَصَلَاتُهَا فِي الدِّرْعٍ وَخِمَارِ وَمِلْحَفَى Pertaining to the woman, she has to have her prayer in a dir. Dir is like a qamis, like a long piece of clothing which covers her whole body. Okay? Like the men wear a thobe, something similar for the woman, right? That's a dir. Khimar is the head covering, what she uses to cover her head and it goes under the neck. Okay? Well, milhafa, the third thing that the uh, also mentions milhafa is the outer garment like the aba uh, outer garment outer coat okay so it's recommended for her to pray in these three imam ibn abi shayba in his musannaf imam ibn abi shayba he's one of the famous imams who collected many of the narrations pertaining to the statements and the actions of the companions radiyallahu anhum as well as ahadith maybe 150 years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu So he's very close to that time. So his Musannaf is very famous for that. In this Musannaf, he collects from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu who said, إِذَا صَلَّتْ الْمَرْأَةُ فَلْتُصَلِّي فِي ثِيَابِهَا كُلِّهَا If a woman prays, then she should pray in all of her clothing. In the dir, in the khimar, and the milhafa, in the three things that we just discussed. Okay? However, the Imam, the author says to us, however, it's permissible for her to pray in just one piece of clothing if it covers her aura. So what's recommended is the three pieces of clothing. But if she has something which can just go from the head all the way down and it's thick enough and it's not tight, then that suffices. Okay? That's why he said, it suffices in covering the aura, uh, whatever she uses, as long as it fits the purpose. But the best is to pray in the three things that we mentioned. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said, وَمَنْ إِنْ كَشَفَ بَعْضُ عَوْرَاتِهِ وَفَحُشْ He's going to speak about now situations where the awra of a person may become uncovered. Okay? And he used the word وَفَحُشْ وَفَحُشْ in some of the translations in English, if you have those books, it's mistranslated. It's, not, it's translated as lewdness in some books. It doesn't mean lewd here. Here it means a large amount or a large period of time. 
okay, large amount or a large period of time. So if the awrah is covered for a large amount or large period of time, this is what the author is pertaining to, is, is speaking about. Sheikh Abd al-Salam al-Shawayr, in his explanation, he gives a rule. He says we have a rule pertaining to this uh, topic that we are discussing now, which is the uncovering of the awrah. He says, فَإِنْ كَشَفَتْ عَوْرَةٌ فِي صَلَاةٌ مُتَعَمِّدًا بَطَلَتْ صَلَاتُهُ He said, if a person uncovers his awrah on purpose in the prayer, then his salah is invalid. If it's on purpose, it's invalid, right? سَوَاءً الَّذِي انْكَشَفَ قَلِيلًا أَوْ كَثِيرًا He said, whether the amount of the awrah which is exposed is a little or a lot. وَسَوَاءً كَانَتْ الْمُدَّةَ طَوِيلًا أَوْ قَصِيرًا And whether or not the time period for its being exposed was a little or a lot. So a person who does it on purpose, whether it's a little amount or a lot amount, whether it's a little amount of time or a lot amount of time, then his law is invalid. طيب. And then he says, the Shaykh uh, Abdul Salam al-Shawayr, he says, وَأَمَّا وَأَمَّا إِنْ كَشَفَتْ عَوْرَةٌ فِي صَلَاةٍ نَاسِيًا He said, as for the one whose awrah, his private area becomes exposed out of forgetfulness, Right? فَإِنْ كَانَتْ الْمُدَّةَ قَلِيلًا If the time period is a little أو المقدار قليلة صحت صلاته Or the amount that is exposed is a little Then his prayer is valid And if not, if it's other than that Then his prayer is invalid So the Shaykh, he gives eight different scenarios Based upon this rule that he gave He said, if somebody uncovers intentionally A little amount of awrah For a little amount of time What's the ruling here? Huh? Batil, why? You're saying batil, right? Yes, it's invalid, but you missed an important point. Jazakallah khair, which is that he did it intentionally, right? He did it intentionally, so here's the important point. A person does intentionally little for a long time, again, batil. If he does a lot of uncovering for a little time, again, batil, okay? But in a situation where it's unintentional, the situations where it's unintentional now, the first of them, if it's a little bit of his awra for a little bit of time, then his salah is valid. A little bit of his awra is exposed for a little amount of time, salah is valid. If it's a little amount of the awra for a long amount of time, the salah is also valid. But if it's a lot, okay, a lot of awra for a little amount of time, salah valid. However, a lot for a long time, that's where the salah becomes batil. A lot for a long time. Trying not to confuse you, yeah? It's just the way the ulama have explained it. We need to take it the way they gave it to us. And also the Shaykh Abdul Salam Shawayi, he said, but you need to add to this also, which is that the awra al-mughallada for the man and the woman, the actual, sorry, for the man, the actual private parts themselves. The private parts themselves. If a little bit of the private part itself, not just the awra, is uncovered, then that equates a lot of it being uncovered. Right? So if it's a little amount of the actual private part itself, many a times I've seen it in Jummah and I've had to mention to people, they're sitting there or they're praying and their pants are literally falling down and you have the shock of your life. You're seeing the man's aura literally in front of you, right? So this person's salah is, according to what the ulama is saying, is in a very dangerous situation, right? A little amount is considered a lot. And especially that people, they don't realize and they allow this to continue for a long time, then the salah is invalid. The author, he says, another way that the salah can become invalid, if a person has covered his awrah, but he's praying in clothing which is haram. Clothing which is haram. What are the ways that your clothing can be haram? What are the ways that your clothing can be haram? They mention, المحرم لعينه It's haram due to its essence. The material of the clothing is in of itself haram. طيب. أو المحرم لكسبه Or the clothing is haram because of the way it was gotten. It's stolen, for example. Okay? So that makes it haram also. أو المحرم لحيئته Or it's haram due to what is put upon the clothing. Pictures, etc. put upon the clothing becomes haram. Or it's under your ankles, if you hold that opinion, then it becomes haram. Right? And the fourth is Al-Muharram lil khuyala fihi. It can become haram due to a person showing off in it. Okay, so, th so these are the four ways, categories, that cause clothing to be haram. So why is it invalidating the salah? Because the rule in fiqh 
according to the humbly scholars, the majority of them, and Allah knows best, is that إِذَا عَادَ النَّهِي إِلَى شَرْطِ الْإِبَادَةِ فَإِنَّهُ يَقْتَدِي الْفَسَادِ إِذَا عَادَ النَّهِي إِلَى شَرْطِ الْإِبَادَةِ فَإِنَّهُ يَقْتَدِي الْفَسَادِ That if the prohibition is connected to one of the conditions of the prayer, then this dictates that it's invalid, okay, or that it's improper, invalid and improper. If the prohibition is connected to a condition of the prayer, like covering the aura, then this will dictate that if the person does this prohibition, then the action is going to be invalid. Tayyib, question, as put by Sheikh Mutlaq Jasir in his explanation of this book. He said, if somebody's wearing a silk turban, what is the ruling? Somebody's wearing a silk turban while praying. What's the ruling here? <laughs> it's quite strange, right? <laughs> but let's say some strange person is wearing it. I can't hear you, sorry. Men are not allowed to wear silk. This is part of the answer. But what's going on here? What's happening to the prayer? What ruling do we give to the player? Prayer. What did you say? Anyone else? Invalid. It's invalid, right? Anyone else? Ahsant, barakallahu feek. Very good. It's not pertaining to the aura, right? So if it was pertaining to the aura, then the rule that I mentioned before applies. He's covering his head, so he's sinful for covering his head with something which is haram, but it doesn't invalidate the salah because the, the, the prohibition is not returning to the condition of the prayer which is covering the aura. Right? So this is an interesting question that he put for us to use our minds. The Imam, he says also, what can cause the Salah to be invalidated? If the person prays in an impure thob, then he has to repeat his Salah. Meaning that he chose to pray in an impure thob. He was able to pray in other than an impure thob. He had the ability, the qudra. Then in this situation, if he prays in an impure thob, a najis thob, he has to repeat the prayer. But if he forgot about the impurity of the thobe, that there was impurity on it, or he was unaware of the impurity, whether in ruling, he wasn't sure if it's impure, this thing, or not impure, or he literally forgot, then that's Sheikh Khalid al mushaykh and his explanation mentions, then this is overlooked. Okay? Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr, he says, to question us again, he says, if a person has only a silk thobe, what's the ruling of silk thobe? for you to pray. It's not allowed, right? If you have a silk thobe or a nudges thobe or a stolen thobe, that's all you have. <laughs> Which one of them should you pray in? You have a silk, you have a nudges or a stolen? Pray in stolen. <laughs> pray in the silk one, huh? MashaAllah, tabarakallah. He's right. Pray in the silk one. Why? He said because the tahrim here is a khaf. The prohibition here is less. Why? Because it's permissible for women. And in fact, it's permissible for men also in certain situations. So the tahrim is a khaf. The tahrim, the prohibition is less. So in this strange situation, the person will pray in the silk thobe. Now, another question he asked, what if you only have a thobe which is najis and stolen? So forget the silk now. Najis and stolen, what do you do here? Huh? Why? Why do you say najis? Very close. Good. Ahsantum. The, the najis at times is overlooked. If you remember in the Kitab al-Tahara, the chapter of purification, there's some types of impurities that if they're small amount, they're overlooked. That's the first thing. The second thing is that stealing is never overlooked, any amount of stealing. So based upon this, you would pray in the what? In the najis thobe, if it's najis or stolen. Third question and last. Now you only have a stolen thobe. <laughs> what do you do? Now you only have a stolen thumb, what do you do? Huh? You pray in the stolen thumb. No, it's not allowed, you have to pray naked. Okay, in this situation, you have to pray naked because your salah will not be accepted in the stolen thumb, but it will be accepted in, the, in, in nudity because you had nothing else which was valid for you to pray in. Okay, so the stolen thumb, in no situation, are you allowed to pray in it as mentioned by Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr, Hafidahullah Ta'ala. The author, he says, وَمَنْ حُبِسَ فِي مَحَلِّ النَّجِسِ And with regarding to a person who is imprisoned 
in an impure place. Okay? Sorry, the author, he said, لا من حبس في محل النجس The rules don't apply to the one who is imprisoned in an impure place where there's lots of impurity. Here the rules don't apply in the sense that his salah will be invalidated. Why? So he's going to have nudges on his clothing, etc. Why? Why is, why is the ruling not given to him that your prayer is invalid? He has no other way. He has no other way. What? Fear Fi Allah as much as you can, right? The Prophet ﷺ said. طيب. If the najasa is wet, how does a person pray? If the najasa on the ground and around him is of the wet type, how does the person pray? Hmm. Huh? Yeah, no, you have nothing. This is the whole point. You have nothing to prevent yourself from touching the najasa. If the najasa is wet, they say when you go to make sujood and you bringing yourself close to that area where the najasa is, you don't make sujood. You make ima. Ima is just you, 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 um, you move with your head. Okay? You move with your head to show that. Tayyip. The author, he says, وَمَنْ وَجَدَ كِفَايَةَ عَوْرَتِهِ سَتَرَهَا If a person finds an amount of material which suffices covering his awrah, then it's obligatory upon him to cover his awrah, obviously. وَإِلَّا And if he doesn't find that, he has material, but it's not enough to cover his awrah. From the belly button to the knees, what does he do? Only the private parts. Only the private parts. Then, farjain. And if now he doesn't have enough for the private parts, what does he do? The author says, فَإِن لَمْ يَكْفِيهِمَا فَالدُّبْرِ And then if it's not enough to cover both private parts, he has to cry, uh, cover the back private part. Why? Somebody could be praying behind you and it's, it's worse uh, than the front private part when you go into certain positions in the salah. Okay? But if the person does choose to cover the front private part instead of the back, then that's permissible, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al the author, he says, وَإِنْ عُيِّرَ سُطْرَةً لَزِمَهُ قَبُولَهَا If the person is lent something to cover his awrah, and he's in a situation where he doesn't have something to cover his awrah, then he has to accept it. He has to accept it. Right? As mentioned by Shaykh Muqtalaq Jasal. What, what, is the, uh, what is the fiqh rule here? What is the fiqh rule? Do you remember? That here, we are speaking about something which is obligatory. مَا لَا يُتِمُّ الْوَاجِبْ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبْ That thing by which the obligation is not going to be fulfilled except by having it, then it becomes obligatory to have it. Right? So that's a rule in fiqh. If you have something, an obligation you need to fulfill, then that which leads to that obligation or helps you fulfill the obligation itself becomes obligatory. Here, meaning covering the awra. So a person is giving you Something lending you, you can't say to him, No, I don't want it from you because you don't like the way he looks, right? You have to say no to yourself, I'm going to take it from him. So they say that in this situation, if it's lent to you, you have to take it, but not if it's gifted to you. There's a difference because with gifts, there's something which they call minna. Minna is like the person <clears throat> can hold you to account for having given you that gift. It's as though you owe him something. You know, some people, they behave with you in that manner. When they give you a gift or a favor, they always remind you. Or they kind of have one above you. So if it's to do with that, that you feel that you'll be humiliated by accepting the gift from the person, then in this situation, you do not have to. And Allah knows best. The one who is nude, doesn't have anything to cover his or her aura with, then it's highly recommended, mustahab recommended, that the person prays sitting down and does the movements by gesturing the head. Okay? Gestures the head when going into ruku and gestures the head when going into sujood. How does the person sit in this situation? We'll come to this. Zakallah khair. Hassan. Barakallah fiqh. So the author is saying, like, it's highly recommended if you are nude to pray sitting down, right? How do you pray sitting down? On the ground, obviously, right? But uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he would pray, it's narrated 
that كان يصلي جالسا متربعا The Prophet ﷺ would sit like the brothers here, cross-legged. This is how the Prophet ﷺ would pray if he was sitting down, right? But here they say you don't do that. Here you try to bring your thighs close as possible together to cover your private part, right? If you're able to do that. However, Sheikh Abd al-Salam al he said if you wanted to pray standing, you can pray standing as the brother mentioned, okay? So the person who's naked, it's highly recommended for him to pray sitting down and to gesture the movements of bowing and sujood. The author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him, وَيَكُونُ إِمَامُهُمْ وَسْطَهُمْ If praying in jama'ah, if praying in jama'ah, where is the imam? In the middle. Why in the middle and not in front? Obvious reason, you don't want to be staring at his awrah, right? So if it's a group of people, may Allah protect the Muslims and the honor of the Muslims, they find themselves in such a situation, then they have to pray wujuban like this, that the imam obligatory is to be in the middle of the jama'ah. Unless, what's the exception? So when jama'ah, salat al jama'ah, everybody, may Allah protect the Muslims, is naked. So we said that the imam has to be in the middle. What's the exceptions? Everyone's blind. That's one exception. It's extremely dark. That's the second exception, right? As mentioned by Sheikh Hassan al Da'ila in his explanation of the book. And notice here also, it shows you the importance of the Salat al Jama'ah. Don't miss the congregational prayer. Look, we know that whilst fighting, defending the lives of the Muslims and the Muslim borders, there's still a prayer. Whilst being in this horrible situation where people are naked, they still have to pray together, right? So the Salat al Jama'ah is something which is so important in Islam, we shouldn't take it easy in missing this. So the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, Al Hajawi, he said, If May Allah protect the Muslims, they're in a situation where they're imprisoned, men and female, naked together. May Allah protect the Muslims. Then in this situation, every gender has to pray by themselves, obviously, right? Has to pray by themselves, yeah? How do they do it? He said, they pray by themselves. But if it's difficult because they're mixed together, He said, what you do is that if the men and the women are together in such a situation, then the men pray facing the Qibla and the women face the opposite way, away from the Qibla. When the men have finished, the men sit down, they're not allowed to turn around obviously, and then the women pray. So this way no one is looking at each other uh, in that horrible situation when they are praying. Tayyip. The author he says, فَإِنْ وَجَدَ سُطْرَ قَرِيبَةً فِي أَثْنَاءِ صَلَاةِ سَطْرَ وَبَنَا وَإِلَّا إِبْتَدَأَ If the person finds that which he's able to cover himself with. So he was in a situation where he didn't have anything to cover himself with. But then he heard maybe somebody's come with clothing and it's going to take him movement in the prayer to get that clothing to cover himself with. If it's close and close is defined by what is customarily defined as being close, then he's allowed to do that and he continues with his prayer. He doesn't have to break his prayer. He takes the steps, goes to the door, grabs the clothing, puts it on, carries on his prayer. But if it takes more than a little bit of movement, like it's far away from him, in this situation he has to break his prayer, cover his awrah and then start the prayer again from the beginning because the movements of the salah were too much. So what, is, what defines for us what is too much movement in the salah? Al-urf. Al-urf muhakkama that the, uh, the customer, customary norms of the society or of the people is that which defines it. Say again, please. So, so what I mean, for example, what they mean here is that because the Sharia hasn't defined for you what is a lot of movement in the prayer or in this situation, then it's what is understood from you, your experiences of growing up in a particular place. So me, for example, what I understand, if I do about three movements, I know this is getting too much, right? That's my experience of, and, and what I've been brought up with, right? My community, three to four movements, that's too much. For some people, it could be 10 movements is, is, is valid, right? In such a situation. So it, this is what they mean here. Then the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, says, وَيُكْرَهُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ أَصَدَلْ And it's disliked to have a sadal in the salah. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Abi Dawood and Ahmad, it's narrated by Abu Huraira and the Nabi ﷺ, Naha an isadal fi salah wa an yugati a rajal fahu. That the Prophet ﷺ forbade sadal in the prayer and that a person covers his face. 
was praying. So what is sadal? The ulama that explained that sadal is that you get clothing and you throw it over your shoulders from behind and you leave it like that. So it's not wrapped around, nor is it joined. It's just hanging over your shoulders, like a, a Superman robe or something. Just hanging over your shoulders, right? And then it's not joined, nor is it wrapped around. This is sadal. Another meaning of sadal in the salah is to have the hands down. But what they're speaking about here is pertaining to that clothing as I've described. The Imam, he says, what istimal asamma. And also this is disliked. Istimal asamma. Istimal asamma has different interpretations. From the most popular of the interpretations amongst the scholars in the Hamli Madhab, they say it means that you wrap your clothing around you without your arms being in the sleeves. So maybe somebody has a type of clothing and their arms are not in the sleeve, but they've wrapped it around tight to the extent that their, their hands are like this. Right? So this is makru. Why do you think it's makru to, to have that type of clothing in the salah? Yeah, exactly. You go for sujood, you're going to headbutt the floor, right? You're going to have a big bruise on your head. What else? So many sunnah you're missing out on. Rafa al-yadayn, putting your hands where they should be in the salah, etc. Right? Being able to defend yourself if you need to from something harmful in the salah. So this is why, one of the, some of the reasons that they say. Right? Ishtimal as-samma. However, Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, he quotes, he says that uh, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala, in some of the linguistics, they said, no, the meaning intended here is not the wrapping of the clothing in the way that I described. He said the meaning intended here is al-ittiba. Al-ittiba like you do in Hajj and Umrah, where the man has one of his shoulders uncovered and the rest of the clothing is going underneath the armpit. He says to wrap your clothing in that way is what is makru in the salah, unless you have clothing under that. I think some cultures like in Nigeria and Africa, they have that type of clothing, that they wrap the clothing around in that particular way, which exposes part of their shoulder, but it's allowed for them. Why is it allowed for them? Because they have clothing under that. So none of the skin is exposed. If the skin was exposed like in Umrah and Hajj, then that is what is being referred to here. Okay? So this is makru. The author, he says, وَتَغْتِيَةُ And also to cover your face, as we said, right? To cover your face is not allowed, as mentioned in the hadith that we just quoted of Ahmed and Abi Dawood, right? What did the hadith say? That al-sadl is not allowed and also for a man to cover his face in the salah. Why do you think one of the reasons would be that it's not, it's disliked for a man to cover his face in the salah? Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah in his explanation of Umdat al-Fiqh in al-Umda he said when a person is standing in prayer he is receiving the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descending upon him so for him to cover his face it's as though he's blocking the blessings of Allah azawajal. he shouldn't be doing that you're receiving spiritual gifts from Allah azawajal, so it's as though it's, you shouldn't be blocking it right? whether you're standing or whether you're in the sujood don't block that which is between you and the prayer of Allah Azawajal with covering your face. Unless one is sick, okay, and you're sneezing. Don't put it because he may be a criminal. Pardon? He may be a criminal, like Take it off, exactly. Take it off, keep it off, keep us safe. Very good. So the ulama, they're saying here that the, uh, the illa, as I mentioned, Sheikh Islam and Taymiyyah, one of the reasons he mentioned, apart from being mentioned the hadith, is not to... Pr- not to be a barrier between you and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said an exception is if one is sick, for example, okay? So if you're sneezing away, then you can cover with something, okay? Or if a woman, she's in the prayer and she's surrounded by non-mahram, meaning she's surrounded by men who are not related to her, then she should cover her face, okay? If you hold that opinion. And there's a qa'idah that anna kulla makruh, kulla makruhin tartafi'u, Al-kiraha in the haja That every, uh, every disliked act okay, is removed when there's a need. So if there's a need, like we said, someone's sick or a woman has non-mahram around her, then the qaida says, Anna kulla makruhin tartafi'u al-kiraha in the haja The author, rahimahullah, he said, Walitham ala fammihi wa anfi. And also makru is to have not your face covered now fully, but your nose and your mouth with some kind of wrap, okay? Unless it's very cold or there is a clear reason to do so. Then the author says, What also delight, disliked in the prayer, وَكَفُّ كُمِّهِ وَلَفُّهِ 
وَلَفُّهُ وَكَفُّ كُمِّهِ وَلَفُّهُ And to... What's disliked in the prayer is if you were to roll up your clothing, okay? Or you were to fold it up. Rolling it up or folding up clothing in the prayer or for the prayer is disliked. Because in the hadith in Bukhari in Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَسْجُدَ عَلَى سَبْعَةِ أَعْظُمْ وَلَا أَكُفُ ثَوْبًا وَلَا شَعْرًا I was commanded to prostrate upon seven limbs and that I shouldn't roll up or fold up clothing or hair in the prayer. Leave the hair and don't fold up the clothing in the prayer. Unless the ulama say it's a type of clothing like the shimag, which is customarily worn and you have to fold it over, right? To keep it on your head. They said this type of uh, stuff is allowed, but it's better to avoid. So the author, he said that also disliked is to roll up the clothing or to fold up the clothing in the prayer. Then he says, وَشَدُّ وَسْطِهِ كَزُنَّارِ And also to tie something tight around the middle, uh, around the waist in the prayer is disliked. Why? Because this is what was known to be done by the Christians. The Christian priests and a lot of the Christians that used to wear this type of clothing, that something, a belt of some sort would be around their clothing, their thobes. And this is why it's disliked for us to do so in Islam because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith collected by Ahmad مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever imitates a people in that which is specific to them to them in their clothing or their habits, celebrations, etc. then he's from them. Listen to the wording of the hadith, very serious. مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ If you imitate a people in their behavior, in their clothing or their culture or their norms which is specifically known to be for them then you become like them. And Sheikh Islam in Taymiyyah, he said, it's very important to know that when you start to imitate a people outwardly, this will affect your inward uh, outlook too. Psychologically, you'll be affected by wanting to be like them more and more, by accepting more and more what they accept. Okay? So it's very dangerous for us to imitate those who we are not supposed to imitate if it's something which is specific to them. What was the point I was making? That this zunnar, which is tying something tight a belt type of thing around the waist. Uh, if it's done in a way which is, resembles that which is specific to the non-Muslims, then it's not allowed. If it's not done in that way, then it's allowed. But for the woman, it's not allowed in all situations. As for her to tie something tight like some women do today when they go shopping, etc., to have that type of clothing which is tight around the waist and it shows what it shouldn't show, it's not allowed. The Imam says, we're coming to the end, And it's forbidden to show off, it's forbidden to show off in clothing and other than it. In the hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet said, Man jarra thawbahu min al-khuyala, la lam yandurullahi ilayhi yawm al-qiyama. He said, whoever drags his clothing, because dragging clothing used to be something in the past that people would do, out of pride, right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever drags his clothing, okay, then Allah جل, out of pride and out of showing off, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't look at him on the day of judgment. He will be ignored. He will be ignored by Allah جل, receiving nothing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us from that. So the famous opinion in the madhab is that if the clothes are below the ankle, okay, but not due to showing off, then it's not haram. It's makru, okay? And in fact, this is the opinion of the majority of scholars, that if the clothing is below, I'm not saying it's the correct opinion, but it's the opinion of the majority of scholars and the opinion of the madhab, that if the clothing is below the ankles, then the, the punishment is not pertaining to this person. It's pertaining to the one who does that with showing off. Okay, the one who does that while showing off. When is showing off allowed, as a side point? We said that showing off is not allowed, right? In all situations, except for one. Ahsant, in the battlefield, in front of your enemies. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see when the person struts and walks around and shows his presence in front of the enemies. Then this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see. What taswir? The author said he's not allowed to make pictures. What's he referring to here? Pictures of what? Of living beings, that which has a soul in it, of anything which resembles a living being. In Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, who had something on her pillow or something of that nature of a living being, the Prophet said, Inna ashab That verily the people who made these pictures are going to be punished on the day of judgment. It will be said to them, bring to life what you created. 
This creation is for Allah alone, not for us to try and create living beings, right? Then he said, That verily the angels will not enter into a house whereupon there is a picture of a living being. So due to that, it's not allowed to have clothing which has a picture of a living being in it. Or using them, meaning using it whilst praying. It's also impermissible to have clothing which has gold on it, like gold threads, etc. Or that which is dyed in gold. So it comes out with gold colouring. Okay? If it actually has gold on it, in terms of threading, etc., or something of that nature, or it's dyed in gold, this is not allowed. Why? Because Ahmed and Abi Dawood, may Allah have mercy upon them, collect the narration of Ali radiallahu anhu where he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa took silk and put it in his right hand. Then he took gold and put it in his left hand. Then he said, these two things are impermissible for the male of my ummah. And in the narration of Ibn Majah, he said, uh, But it's permissible for the female of them, right? So pertaining to silk and gold, it's not allowed to have it in the clothing. Pertaining to gold, sorry. It's not allowed to have it in the clothing if it's the physical glow, gold or even the colouring of the gold. The author, he says, And you're not allowed to have the gold colouring before istihala. Istihala is that the properties of a thing change to, to wherein they become something else. So here it's referring to the colour of the gold. If the colour of the gold has changed due to a particular process that took place or to some other reason, then the, the clothing will be permissible if it was dipped in that. Okay, so originally it was gold colouring, but due to whatever reason it became something else, istihala, then the clothing is permissible. Why? Because the rule in fiqh, الحكم يدور مع إلته وجودا وعدما that the rule revolves around the cause for the ruling whether it's present or not present okay so if the cause for the ruling is present then you give the ruling if the cause for the ruling is not present then the ruling is taken away الحكم يدور مع إلته وجودا وعدما then he says وثياب حرير and also it's impermissible to, for the man to pray in silk what about manufactured silk Man Say again please Manufactured silk is allowed As mentioned by Sheikh Hamad Al-Hamad In his explanation of the book What it's referring to the prohibition Is the natural silk, silk. The author says وَمَا هُوَ أَكْثَرُ ظُهُورًا عَلَى ذكور لا إذا استوايا. What he means here Can somebody just read me the translation of this part please A bit louder what you have وَمَا هُوَ أَكْثَرُ ظُهُورًا عَلَى ذكور لا, إس... لا إذا استوايا. You have it? Yes, in the garments made predominantly of silk are also forbidden. I didn't hear a word. Garments predominantly made of silk are prohibited. Yeah. Forbidden, sorry. Yeah. Next. For men, except if the silk is in the garment and doesn't appear to be prohibited. Okay, Zakallah khair. So basically, what he's saying, the author is saying that if the garment has silk contained in it, or on it, but it doesn't go beyond more than half of the garment, then it's permissible. Okay? So silk in a garment should be avoided, but if it happens to be there, and it's not more than half of the garment, then it's permissible to pray in that. Okay? This is the rule that he's saying. And also it's permissible if there is a need. For example, like hikka. Hikka is a type of skin disease which causes you to itch a lot. And you can't find relief from it except by wearing silk. In this situation, we're allowed. Or other types of sickness. Or marad. Or harbin. Or in the older times, they used to uh, wear silk in their clothing, in their armor, as it used to prevent the arrows from going deep into them. And it used to be a way of showing the enemy uh, looking special in front of the enemy. Okay, because the rule says, Al-Dururat tubihu tubihu al-Mahdurat. al Tabihu al mahdurat That uh, when you're in a state of necessity, then that which is impermissible now becomes permissible due to the necessity. So in states of necessity, the impermissibility is removed or lifted due to you being in a, in a state of necessity. So look how 
generous Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the Sharia. A lot of people all the time they think Sharia barbaric, backward, difficult. Sharia is something easy for the creation. Wherever there's difficulty, you will find that Allah Azawajal gives ease, gives you the option for each. You can't pray standing, pray sitting. You can't pray sitting, you pray laying, laying down. You can't find wudu to make tayam, uh, uh, water to make wudu, make tayammum. The whole Sharia is based upon ease, right? And this is something we should be proud of. So he says also as an exception to the rule of silk being forbidden is our hashwan. If that the silk is used in clothing or in other things as stuffing or lining. If it's used in stuffing on the inside of the clothing, then it's permissible. Okay? He says, Or it's a symbol on the clothing, the space of four fingers width or less. Because the Prophet is narrated by uh, Umar ibn Khattab, who said that the Prophet Naha and Lubs al Harir. The Prophet forbade the men to wear silk, except for the area of two fingers or three or four in terms of width. Okay? However, Shaykh, um, Shaykh Khalid al Mushaykh, in his explanation, he said that this is pertaining to width, right? But length, there's no limit. The width of the silk shouldn't be more than four in a place on the clothing. But in terms of length, going downwards, there's no limit to how long or how much silk is there. And also, this forbiddance is that it shouldn't be more than four fingers in one place. So if you have in different parts of the thobe, silk, but it's like four fingers, then four fingers, and four fingers, but in different parts of the thobe, and not more than half of the thobe, then this is allowed also. Okay? And Allah knows best. Then he says, أو رِقَعًا And also an exception for the silk is that it's used as patchwork. If the patchwork in the clothing is made from silk, that's also allowed. And also as an exception, أو لَبِنَةَ jayb Or the place of the neck. Okay? The top of the garment, the collar of the garment is made from silk. That is also allowed. Again, four fingers in width. Okay? But in length, they say it's permissible. I'm just thinking, how would you do four fingers in width? Maybe just part of the collar or the area. Maybe something of that nature, yeah. So they say no more than four fingers in width. Wasuj of Fira. Wasuj of Fira is like, you know, you have coats and the, or, or long clothing, something of that nature. Then the embroidery on the edges of the clothing, if it's made from silk, then this is also an exception. They say, وَيُكْرَهُ الْمُعَصْفَرُ And it's disliked to have clothing which is mu'asfar. Mu'asfar is that it's made from, uh, the, the dye is taken from a particular plant which turns the clothing red. This is something which is uh, extremely disliked. Because the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Muslim, he saw Amr ibn As wearing thawbayni mu'asfarayn, two pieces of clothing which were of this color, mu'asfar. And he said, إِنَّ هَذِهِ ثِيَابُ الْكُفَّارِ فَلَا تَلْبَسْهَا he said, this is the clothing of the kuffar, so do not wear it. So what it's pertaining to is red clothing, which is all red. Right? So those of you who have those magic suits in your cupboard, you need to get rid of them. If it's a red suit completely, then you can't wear it. But if it has other color with it, then it's permissible. If it's all red, then it's impermissible. Huh? It says yellow there? The neck? Mu'asfar? Ahmad is not red. Yes. Put red, a mistranslation. Mu'asfar. La la, mu'asfar, this, it makes the color uh, humra. It, it, the, the coloring turns out reddish. The za'faran, which he's going to mention next, is the yellow color. It's the one which becomes yellowish. Right? Did you have a different, what, what are you referring to? The text itself. What does he say? No, no, in Arabic. What, not the translation. Khalas, mu'asfar is the ulama that explained it. It's, it. When it's taken from the plants and it's used as a dye, the clothing comes out red. Tayyib. Al-muza'far is yellow. Okay. Wal-muza'far lil-rijal from za'faran. Clothes dyed with this come out yellow and thus it's makru because in Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu as narrated by Anas, he forbade an yataza'fara al-rajl that the person should wear clothing of this color. And again, it means clothing which is completely of that color. But if it's mixed with other, like it has stripes of some sort of a different color, then it's permissible and Allah knows best. We'll stop here inshallah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us clear understanding of what was taken. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this deed heavy in our scale.
of good deeds on the day of judgment and may Allah forgive me for any shortcomings and mistakes. I mean, if you have questions, then feel free, inshallah.